On July 13, 1870, Otto von Bismarck sent out the Anyone? Anyone? M's dispatch. On July 15, 1870, the German crown prince read the Anyone? Anyone? Mobilization order. On July 20th, 1870, Austria declared, Anyone? Anyone? Neutrality. Some people, like myself, love history, but I'll admit that it can seem boring at times if you don't feel any personal connection to it. The doings of emperors, generals, popes, and lords can be informative, but they rarely give you a glimpse into what real everyday life was like for your German ancestors, who in all likelihood were just average Joes, or should I say average Johans. That's why today we're going to be devoting a whole episode to exploring a day in the life of a German villager during the 1500s to 1800s. We're going to be talking with author and historian Dr. Tiva Scheer, an expert on village life in early modern Germany, about what your German ancestors' childhood was like, what dating was like, how they decided what they were going to do for a living, and what kind of lifestyle they would have lived. All that and more ahead. This is Josiah Schmidt, and you're listening to the German American Genealogist Podcast. As you know, if you listened to last week's episode, the month of October is German American History Month. In celebration of German American History Month, I have been posting one German genealogy tip every day on my blog at schmidtgen.com. This past week, I talked about how Germans often changed their identities after arriving in America. When they immigrated to the United States, Germans would usually anglicize their name. What does anglicize mean, you ask? It's not some new exercise fad that incorporates fishing. One and two and three and cast and one and two and three and reel. Feel the burn. Anglicize means they made their name more English sounding. Some of these changes might be obvious. Wilhelms would become Bills and Adelaides would become Adas. Other name changes might not necessarily be that straightforward. Someone with the name Ludwig might typically become a Louis after arriving in America. A Friederike might become a Rachel. First names aren't the only ones that might have changed when a German immigrant arrived in America. Last names might have been spelled with a more English form of spelling, or they might have been completely translated into English. A German woman named Anna Klein might become Jane Little when she arrives in America. Why is this? Let's think about it. In the German language, J's have a soft pronunciation and E's have a hard pronunciation. So a German person would have pronounced Jane as Hjana. Therefore, the name Jane in German sounds almost identical to how an American pronounces Hannah or Anna. Furthermore, Klein, in German, means little in English. That is why a German immigrant named Anna Klein might become Jane Little in America. I've compiled a full list of German given names and their English counterparts, which you can view on my website, schmidtgen.com. Either go to my blog and look for German genealogy tip number 7, or go to the resources page on my website and click the link that says Anglicizations, English versions, of German names. Many Germans before emigrating would have something called an umlaut in their name. An umlaut is a double dot mark over a vowel that indicates a more fronted or rounded pronunciation. Names like Schäfer, Schröder, or Müller had the umlaut symbol over the first vowel. Without the umlaut over the A, Schaefer would be pronounced Schaffer in German, 
Since English doesn't have this umlaut symbol, nor did the typewriters in America, many Germans dropped the umlaut from their surname and added an E to the vowel instead. Thus, while someone might have spelled Schaefer as S-C-H umlaut A F-E-R in Germany, they would have probably spelled it S-C-H-A-E-F-E-R in America. Another part of a German immigrant's identity that they likely changed when they immigrated to America was their occupation. In Germany, especially by the 1800s, land was scarce, and you were lucky if you possessed a large farm of your own. Since there wasn't a lot of trade between the various small towns of Germany in that era, each town had to be pretty self-sufficient. Each little village in Germany would probably have its own shoemaker, barrel maker, woodworker, linen weaver, and so on. Yet in America, the situation was quite different. Farmland was plentiful and relatively inexpensive. Because America had a well-developed market economy, not every town needed a shoemaker, barrel maker, woodworker, linen weaver, and so on. In America, one town might specialize in barrel making, for instance, and all the towns in the surrounding area could get barrels shipped in to their general store from that town. In America, the demand for jobs was in the farming and mining industries. Therefore, many German immigrants came to America with training in artisanal trades, like shoemaking, tailoring, or linen weaving, but would often switch to farming or mining once they got to America. If the immigrant was German, they were almost guaranteed to find a job on a farm after they came to America because Germans were considered to be the cream of the crop when it came to long, hard manual labor. Now, Mr. Heinrich, why do you feel that you are qualified for this farming job? Well, ever since I came from Germany... That's all I need to hear. When can you start? Most people who research their German ancestry inevitably come to the point where they need to move their research from America to Germany. When that happens, you will need to request information from regional church archives or civil archives in Germany. Some archives, like the Hessian State Archives in Marburg, Germany, will look up information for you for free. Other archives, like a Landeskirchliches Archive, a.k.a. a regional church parish archive, will charge a reasonable fee for looking up vital records in village church books. The keys to requesting information from German archives are 1. Write your requests in German. You'll get a response much faster that way. 2. Know exactly what town your ancestor was from before you send in a research request. And three, be patient with German archives. German archives get a lot of requests. They do a lot with a very small staff. Sometimes you might hear back from a German archive only two weeks after you send in your request. But don't be surprised if six or seven months go by before you hear back from the archive. Wait patiently, be polite, and express your gratitude when a German archive does research for you. Finally, when you get records from Germany, you will find that they write their dates a little bit different from the way we Americans do it. The German form of writing dates might at first feel a bit like you're going backward. Great Scott Marty! In fact, the German way of writing dates is the way that professional genealogists around the world prefer to write dates, and this way makes a lot more sense than the American way. Germans write their dates from smallest increment of time to largest increment of time. In other words, day, month, year. The date October 13th, 2014 would, in America, be written as 10-13-2014. But in Germany, it would be written as 13.10.2014. If you ever receive records from Germany that mention birth, marriage, or death dates, make sure that you get the order of the dates correct and don't mistake the month number for the day number. Again, German dates go day dot month dot year. If you're like me, just collecting birth, marriage, and death dates for your German ancestors doesn't quite cut it. 
When I had traced my German ancestors as far back as I could, I wanted to then know what kind of lives they actually lived. I went to the library to try to find some books on what everyday life was like for German villagers in the 1800s and earlier. Well, first I had to wade through dozens of books on World War I and World War II just to find a small handful of books on Germany before the 20th century. Even then, the only books I could find dealt with major wars, royal families, and politics. There seemed to be no literature whatsoever published on the lifestyles of average German peasants in the 1500s through 1800s. That's why I was so excited when I finally stumbled across one such book on Amazon.com, a book called Our Daily Bread by historian Dr. Tiva Shear. Our Daily Bread deals with all the details of daily life for ordinary Germans in the early modern era. After the break, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Shear about many of the topics she covers in her book, so stay tuned. If you would like to advertise on the German American Genealogist podcast, please click the Advertise With Us link in the podcast section on schmidtgen.com. Since we're such a young podcast, we have some really affordable prices if you would like an ad for your product or service to be featured in one of our episodes. Your advertisement will continue to pay dividends because these podcasts are archived. And everyone who goes back to listen to an older episode will continue to hear your advertisement. Contact us today to get started. Today I'm speaking with author, teacher, and historian Dr. Tiva Shear. Dr. Shear earned her PhD from the University of Colorado in 2000. She wrote her first book, Governor Lady, about former Wyoming Governor Nellie Taylor Ross, the first woman elected governor in America in 1924. Her second book, which is one of my favorite books in my entire collection, is titled Our Daily Bread, German Village Life, 1500 through 1850. Dr. Shear, thank you so much for speaking with me today. I'm really delighted to be with you. Can you tell us about the kind of family background that you come from? Well, my husband and I have very different backgrounds except for our German ancestry, and we both are about one-quarter German. So when I got interested in genealogy, uh, I found that the German records, compared to other countries, are much easier to track because German pastors were so good about keeping really accurate records about marriages, baptisms, and births. So I spent a lot of time uh, working on the German side of our ancestry. How did you become interested in studying history? I earned my PhD not in history, but in public administration. And as you mentioned, the first book that I wrote was a biography of an early female public administrator named Nellie Taylor Ross. And Nellie's family had some very difficult times following the Civil War. She was very interested later with her official biography in kind of hiding the fact that they lost their plantation and they lived from kind of a hand-to-mouth existence. So I had to reconstruct Nellie's genealogy, and in doing so, in, in learning how to comb through historical newspapers and genealogy records and interviewing people, I found that history was so much more interesting than public administration. So once I finished the uh, the biography of Nellie Taylor Ross, I got interested in doing my own family's genealogy based on what I'd learned from that first book. I looked high and low for books in English that dealt with the lifestyles of average German villagers, and I couldn't find a single one until I came across your book, our Daily Bread. What inspired you to write this incredible book? Well, I was curious once I finished 
as much of the genealogy of my husband's and my family that I could based on the written records. And in my case, that took my ancestors back to the 1500s, the mid-1500s. At some point, I thought, well, now I know their names and I know their date and I know who they married, but but what were they like? What was their life like? How different might it have been than my life? So I thought I'd trot down to the library and check out three or four books and discovered, as you did, there really isn't anything there. There is a lot of stuff in the academic literary field, but it's very specialized. So, for example, if you want to study sociology or history or economics or religious history, um, the history of the wars, development of the economy in early modern Germany, you can find all that, but it's pretty tough sledding for most people. So since I had finished the biography, I thought it might be fun to take all of those academic sources and turn them into a fairly easy read for people like me who wanted to know more about their ancestors. How long did it take you to do the immense amount of research for this book, and how hard was it to dig up the information? It took me about four years from beginning of the idea until the book was published. I spend a long time always pulling every book that I can find. Fortunately, I do have academic privileges in a couple of universities, so interlibrary loan helps me a great deal, and I order anything and everything for all of those topics that I mentioned to you, economics, history, sociology, ethnography, and at some point I realized that I probably have enough and it's time to start writing. So I would guess I probably researched about two and a half years before I began to write. And then once I began to write and to organize the book, of course, that's when you find that there are still some holes in what you know. So the researching and the writing kind of twine around one another until finally the book is done. Now, I've seen a lot of photographs of young German children in the 1800s, and one thing that has always struck me about these children is that they sometimes look like they have the hardened face of a 40-year-old on the body of a perhaps 10-year-old. What was childhood like for an average young person in 16th to 19th century Germany? Well, childhood is a actually fairly modern concept. So they were treated to a large extent as small adults. They were dressed as small adults. And work started fairly early for them. The, of course, it was very sex-based so that they were with their mother until they were, oh, say, about age six, and then they might begin to help their father if they were a boy, or by then they were well on their way to helping their mother with the, the domestic chores that she would have been handling. And by the time they were about 16 or so, the many of them would have hired themselves out as servants, or they might have been apprenticed. Can you tell us about how two young people in a village and early modern Germany would have gone about the process of courting and getting engaged? You know, the family was very involved in those kinds of decisions because it was as much an, a, an economic decision as to whom one married as it was, well, it was more an economic decision and a family relationship decision than it was a romantic decision. Now, that doesn't mean that the individual's were not consulted. In many and perhaps most cases, they certainly had an opportunity to speak to a potential spouse, but the arrangement of the marriages generally happened between the two fathers. And there might be a variety of reasons. They would have tended to have been at the same socioeconomic level, and it might have been an alliance that helped both parents. For example, perhaps the children were going to bring um, certain pieces of land into the marriage, and that was going to be a strengthening factor for the family as a whole. What would have happened generally if a young lady were to have become pregnant out of wedlock? By the time the 19th century was moving into its middle years, in other words, 1850 on, it might not have been as bad, but before that it would have been really a, a terrible thing. The births of her children would have been listed either in a separate ledger, or they would have been listed upside down. 
or uh, they would otherwise have been marked as illegitimate children. And if a child is illegitimate, it meant that they were not going to be able to get an occupation because in order to enter one of the guilds, say, if you wanted to become a carpenter, you had to show that you were of honorable birth. And illegitimacy meant that you would never be honorable. Mm. I've seen a lot of uh, German records for births, and it'll say, uh, like, unvereerlichte, and that, I assume, means illegitimate. Exactly. They always mark that. Oh, and they also always mark that it's elige, if, the, if it's legitimate, that is also mm-hmm. noted. And it's not it's not noted just on the, obviously, the baptism, and that, that then makes them legitimate. Uh, well, it makes them legitimate if they were born at the proper time, but it's it continues to follow them. Uh, so that their marriage also records that they were legitimate. I've seen some other records where a child was originally born unvereerlichte, or illegitimate, and later on, um, sometimes maybe even a year later, there will be a note added on to the margin of the record saying a certain fellow has come along and married this child's mother and he has claimed this baby. Did that totally erase the stigma of having been originally illegitimate uh, when a father would come along and marry the unwed mother and claim the child? You know, I have a couple of thoughts on that. One is that you've just illustrated so nicely the careful records that the German pastors kept. You can really follow people through those records all the way through to their death. When you learn that they died at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and they had a bad cold and, you know, um, it's, Wonderful, all you can learn from those records. But to get to your specific question, I think that would depend on the village. So much of this was uh, based on village ordinances. Uh, the, the villagers largely were self-governed. Once they paid their taxes, fees, and tithes to the Lord and the landlord, they were, for the most part, if, if they were in the western and southern part of Germany, they were basically allowed to govern themselves. And so an awful lot of what happened in the villages was based on what the specific village ordinances were in that place. So I can picture that in some villages, they would always have carried the uh, the label of being illegitimate, and in others, perhaps, through custom and village ordinance, the fact that the father and the mother married would have wiped it out. Can you explain to the listeners the difference between... Um fees and taxes and tithes and who would have paid those? Very few of the German uh, villagers owned their own land. Some did, but in most cases they did not. So they would have a landlord and they would owe him rent of some kind and there would also be fees they would have to pay to him. For example, when they married they would have to pay a fee One of the fees that the villagers deeply resented was a rather steep fee when there was a death. And sometimes if a child was going to pick up the property formerly held by a parent, then there would be a transfer fee. So depending on the, of course the book kind of goes into great detail about all the various kinds of fees there could be. And depending on where the village was, these fees could be very large, they could be non-existent in certain areas, or they could be, you know, very nominal. Um, tithes were owed, they were owed to the church, and they would generally be about 10% of the income. What kind of role did the church play in the community, and uh, what kind of role did religion play in the personal lives of Germans in that era? Well, that's one reason I start that. I start the book generally in the the 1500s, and the Reformation happened in that same period of time. And then that changed an awful lot because the lords made the decision whether they were going to become evangelisch, which is what the Germans call it, which means evangelical, or they were going to remain Catholic. And so the villagers in a particular village would be required to pick up the uh, religion of the Lord, and the pastor or the priest had a huge role in kind of supervising how the people lived. If they were following the rules they should follow, They could bring people up for charges if they were violating some of the norms. And so 
religion did play a big part in the villagers' lives. How did the switch in many villages from Catholicism to Lutheranism affect the everyday lives of villagers? One thing that happened is that, of course, if you were going, you were suddenly finding yourself in transition to an evangelish or Protestant church, then the church was largely stripped bare of the saints and the candles. And there were a couple of types of Protestant worship that came in. The first was with Luther, and Luther didn't actually think of himself as founding a church. He thought of himself as attempting to reform Catholicism. So the service was still a lot like it was in the Catholic Church, although it began to change over the years. Those villagers might not have noted as as much change except that the Virgin would have been gone. There would have been no worship of saints. But then shortly after Luther, you had Stingley and some of the uh, Calvinists come in, and they were very severe in how they viewed these things. So there would have been much more of a change in the form of worship and the uh, appearance in the inside of the church if you were uh, a in a church that had become reformed or reformed. But I guess the real big impact would have been the uh, Thirty Years' War, which broke out in 1618 and ran to 1648, because that's when the Holy Roman Emperor began to try to take back some of the territory that had gone to the Protestant sects. And so war broke out, and it really was largely a major European war. You might almost call it the, the predecessor of world wars, Sweden was involved, Spain was involved, uh, the Low Countries were involved, uh, Austria was involved, and the various German princes were involved as they fought over the land of the German territories, and they whipped through and eat all the resources in an area. The villagers would be reduced to eating grass and starving to death, and then things would kind of recover, and then 15 years later, because this war went on a long time, the war would whip through again, and it would happen all over again. So I think that would be one of the big impacts. I had found quite a few soldiers amongst the German men in my ancestry. Uh, generally, would these men have joined the military voluntarily, or were they mainly conscripted? They were conscripted, and that is one reason why so many young men chose to leave the German territories. Now, remember, there was no Germany yet. You know that, I know. And there wasn't really a Germany until 1870, and my book ends before that. So before that, we're talking lots of little principalities and duchies and even kingdoms. And so, for example, if you were a villager in the Grand Duchy of Baden, you were subject to... Um, military service, and perhaps instead of going to military service, you simply fled and avoided conscription. And allow me to conduct a little thought experiment. Uh, let's say that a modern American individual was going to time travel back to a German village in the year 1800. What are some of the biggest ways that the average modern American would have to change their behavior and change the way they interacted with people in order to fit in in a German village circa 1800? Well, I guess one of the things that really shocked me uh, in my research was the degree to which there was social control during that period of time so that there were ways you did things and ways you did not do things. And if you chose to violate the norms of that village, you were ostracized or humiliated. So you pretty much had to walk the straight and narrow. That would mean, for example, you were required to go to church. It would mean that certainly if you were a man, you were allowed to, you know, beat your wife if she needed it. I'm saying this in quotes. But if you were a clear abuser of your wife, that then you would be ostracized. And you might be pulled up in front of the village church court or the court of elders is called a gericht, the, uh, the ruling elders of the town. And you might be charged a fee. In some cases, for example, if the villagers felt that you were guilty of gluttony or, or malicious gossip, they might shame you so that you might find yourself in stocks 
where you might find yourself with a, a metal mask clamped onto your head that you had to wear for a certain period of time. Uh, maybe if, for example, you were being accused of gossip, then it would be a metal mask that uh, it looked like a, a donkey with a long, long tongue to symbolize that you were a malicious gossiper. And no one wanted to be ostracized in that way. So to get back to your original question, I think if you were a young American male, it would be shocking to you that you would not have the degree of freedom to make certain decisions and say certain things that you do in the United States. You would be much more circumspect and you would make sure that you were not violating the norms of your village. What are some of the things that uh, we take for granted today that we might be surprised to learn German villagers manage to live without? I, I'm not sure that this will answer your question, but but it reflects on, on another surprise that I had when I researched the book, and that is the incredible degree to which these villages were self-sufficient. There really wasn't much of a market economy in Germany. Germany did not manage to get to the Industrial Revolution until really after the 1850s. And so before that, if it was produced in the village, then you could have it in the village so that you had an appropriate complement of, of carpenters and masons and tailors and weavers. But generally speaking, if it wasn't produced in the village, if it wasn't food or some kind of a piece of equipment or uh, some other product that was easily manufactured at the village level, then you probably did without. Now, there were Jewish people in these villages, and because Jews were never allowed to own land, they had to make a living in the way they could, and that meant that many of them were itinerant peddlers. They uh, made their living by going from town to town, and they might be providing, for example, the needles that a local village would be incapable of producing, or maybe certain kind of knives or other small uh, pieces of equipment that the villagers had no trade for. But other than that, if it wasn't capable of being produced in the local village, then you had to do without. What kind of food would a German villager have consumed? You know, if any of your listeners have traveled to Germany to visit, and I'm sure many of them have, they probably see that potatoes are everywhere. It's a big part of the German diet now. But potatoes were viewed with great suspicion, and they actually were not adopted until into the 18th century. They were ordered to start using it. Um, but then, of course, potatoes are so nutritious that uh, potatoes became important. Uh, it is, as you know, a cool and damp climate through most of Germany, so there would have been a lot of root vegetables. Cabbage would have been big. Um, depending on where they were, some of the uh, the grain products they produced might have been spelt, S-P-E-L-T. Wheat is problematic in Germany because of that cold, wet climate. So to a certain extent, it was dependent on where they were. The dairy part of Germany would be in the higher mountainous areas that are not good for cultivation. And there could have been wine and grapes in the warmer areas down that um, might experience a little bit more sun, say, near um, Italy. How much time would, a, would an average German villager have had for recreation, and what would they have done for entertainment? Uh, let me back up and share one thing with you before I say that. In many villages, the highest desire of any man was to have enough land, and that doesn't mean own it. It means control enough land to be a full-time farmer. That really surprised me a lot because I would have assumed they would rather have had a trader craft. But it was considered very prestigious if you had enough land that you could farm full-time. And for those who did not have enough land to farm full-time, then they usually had a trader craft on the side, or perhaps for part of the year they hired themselves out as a day laborer. But generally speaking, in this agricultural world in which they lived, the winters were going to be uh, less work-intensive times. So they would have tried to amass as much food as they could to get them through the lean and the dark months. And so the men in particular would have spent some time in the tavern. Uh, women never went to the tavern. 
And in the winter, the, the young people, the girls would have gotten together at various homes for what was called a Schwinstube, where they all got together and they wove together or they sewed together. And often these 16 or 17-year-old girls who were needing to do that, at the end of the evening, the young men would come to join them and there would be uh, a party. How did they normally celebrate holidays and which holidays did they usually celebrate? They were still largely following a liturgical or religious calendar, so some of the important holidays would have, of course, been Easter and the Christmas season. Uh, and then you add in some of the harvest uh, holidays as well. Lichtmas, for example, which means the mass of light. And Josiah, I'm calling on my memory here, I believe Lichtmas happens, that is where they consider the agricultural year to start, if I remember correctly. So it's happening, say, in February. It's the moment where they hope the fields are dry enough where they can begin to do their plowing. So to kind of summarize, you can either look at the major Christian holidays, which we all still celebrate, and those would have been important, but you add on top of it some of the harvest holidays and the uh, agricultural holidays that would have remained with them from the heathen times before Christianity reached Germany. Now, when it comes to Christmas, did they have the Christmas trees and candles and gift giving and that sort of thing? They did, uh, and they loved to sing hymns and they decorated their church with boughs and they decorate, you know, their uh, Christmas trees came later, but certainly they were using greenery throughout. And then, then trees arrived probably by the, the 19th century. Of course, the Germans are wonderful when it comes to choral music. So there would have been a lot of singing, except in the Calvinist churches. There probably was not singing there because, as I said, that the, the Calvinist movement was very stark and very severe. But there certainly would have been singing both in the Catholic churches and in what we think of as Lutheran churches or the Evangelist churches. Uh, but one time they wouldn't have been singing any earlier than the 19th century was Holy Night, Silent Night, Holy Night, because it wasn't written until later. Did they listen to any other sort of music for entertainment? Uh besides strictly choral hymns? Uh, certainly when there was a marriage, there would be a celebration. And probably there would have been music when it was a market day. Not all villages had the permission to have a market day, but market days were always important. And there would be at least one village of larger size or perhaps even a town within walking distance or, or cart driving distance from all the villages and there would be say a day every season or a day every month or a day every year where there would be a big market and that would be an opportunity for music and for buying things you can't usually get and for people to celebrate together. Earlier in the conversation you mentioned that um, somebody who was born out of wedlock might not get assigned a career how did somebody in a uh, German village during that era get into a career field? Uh, let's go back to what I mentioned about the fact that these villages, once they paid their taxes and fees, they were largely self-governed. The officials that ran the village would have been elected from within the villagers themselves. Any villager, any male villager who had what's called burger status, we think of that as the burgers, B-U-R-G-H-E-R -E in English. In German, it's B-U-Umlaut, R-G-E-R. And that meant that you were a citizen of that village or that place with full rights. So among the burgers, they would elect a small ruling council called the Gericht, and it was the job of the Gericht to make sure that the village did well economically and also to resolve any complaints that occurred between villagers. So one of the roles uh, was the economic role, and the Gericht controlled how many people could practice various occupations. So they might decide, for example, that in a village of 1,500, the village could really only support two carpenters or one wheelwright, or uh, one cooper, uh, barrel maker. And so they would set the maximum number of people in that village who could practice that occupation. And often those licenses went from son to son. 
they would still have to be granted by the Gericht, but but when a man who uh, had a license as a cooper died, then the Gericht would award that license to someone else, and as I say, probably the son, who had been working along with his father, so at that point was, you know, experienced and, and knew the trade. One thing that I've noticed in particular in German documents is that um, there seems to be a lot of different words that basically connote working with the land. I've seen um, Bauer, Ackermann, Anspanner. Is there any difference between these different seeming versions of the word farmer, or um, are they basically just synonyms? And and that comes into where you are from. Uh, you will also find a lot of different words that indicate that someone is living in a place but it does not have full burger status. But you're talking about the differences that occurred within a region. So that most of my people, the area where my ancestors came from, uh, is no what is now North Baden-Württemberg, and Bauer would have been the term. But I don't know whether you also noticed, Josiah, that uh, over time, the way a person was designated could change in the records. So for example, when a young man married, he would have been listed as the son of whomever, and he might or might not have had an occupation listed at that point. But by the time his first child was born, assuming it was a legitimate child, then he would have been listed usually with some kind of an occupation. Or he might just have been listed as a burger, which showed that he had full citizenship status within the village. Uh, but if he was a carpenter, then that would also be listed with his name. And then as the years went on and his parents died or his wife's parents died and he came into control of more land, then he might be listed purely as just a bawa because at that point he can live off of his farming labor and, um, and foodstuffs that he has grown. What were some of the biggest motivators that spurred German villagers to leave their hometown and emigrate? By the, the 18th century, so we're talking the 1700s, the population had grown to such a degree that the amount of land any particular villager had was probably very small. Let me back up for a second and mention something else. There are a couple of forms of inheritance that apply in Germany. In one form of inheritance, which would be familiar to us, uh, the eldest son inherits, and the other children um, receive a payment of some kind to help them start their life, but the eldest son gets all of the land. And so where that happens, for example, in far southern Württemberg, then people actually lived on a farm because that farm was handed down intact. But in a lot of other places where my people were from, for example, Instead, all the children inherited equally. So there was a great deal of attention given to exactly what each person came into a marriage with, down to the last handkerchief. And all that had to be accounted for. And when there was a death, then there was another accounting, and then all of the children shared equally. So what happened as the population grew is that the pieces of land available to any individual or any couple got smaller and smaller. And in some cases, the village ruling council, the Gericht, started to refuse permission for villagers to marry because they worried that the family would not be able to support itself and the village would be stuck with essentially supporting people on welfare. So they refused permission for people to marry, and of course, the logical thing happened. That meant that the rate of illegitimacy went up, and we already can see that that's a problem because then you can't practice an occupation. So really, the only way out for many of these people were to immigrate either east to the Russian lands where the Russian czars and lords were interested in bringing in good German farmers, or to the west to North America. Did a German person's village council or later on the uh, imperial government uh, 
Did they ever impose any obstacles or restrictions to stop villagers from emigrating, or was that something that they actually encouraged? You know, they were very ambivalent about it. Uh, the reason is that the fact that all these people wanted to emigrate was kind of a black eye that the government, and, and I'm not talking about the imperial government because that was in the 1870s. Let's go earlier and we'll talk about say, the Grand Duchy of Baden or the Kingdom of Württemberg. If these people were all leaving, then it was an indication that they could not make a good life where they were. So that was embarrassing to the government. And on the other hand, they saw helping people to leave might be a good way to solve their problem of overpopulation. So in some cases, either the local village would come up with money to help people immigrate, or the local government, the, the duchy government or the, the Württemberg government would come up with money actually to help people leave. You would think that another option for these villagers who suddenly found themselves without enough land would simply be to move to a city and take a job. But you have to remember at this point, there still was no industrial revolution. There were no factory jobs for them to go to. And they had a great deal of trouble getting permission to live in another village because all of the villages were struggling with the same problem of overpopulation and they would refuse permission for people who did not have burger status to move to a new place. So the only option was have less and less money, watch your family begin to starve, or move away out of the German territories. You mentioned that some people might think these German villagers should just move to cities, uh, which reminds me of a, another question. We've talked a lot about life in German villages, but what are some of the biggest differences in culture and tradition between German villages and large German cities or urban centers in the 16th to 19th centuries? The cities had an interesting piece of history as well in that if you could get to a city and you were able to live there for an entire year, then you were allowed to stay in that city. And there were, of course, many more employment options in the cities. I and mean, there was a little bit of proto-industry at that point. Um, and there were more craft guilds and uh, there was more of a trading economy from city to city. I mean, it still was kind of, you know, primitive, but, but you had more options to live there. And, of course, with any larger place, there were still social controls on what you said and what you did, but they would probably not have been as strict as they would have been in the small villages where everybody knows you and they know everything that you're doing. The primary difference would be that you had a certain degree of greater freedom in the cities, and if you could acquire that ability to live there, then you probably had more options available to you to make a living. You mentioned in your book, Our Daily Bread, that um, women who aged were sometimes um, seen as old or elderly by the time they were you know, 40 or 50 years old, while men kind of reached their peak at 50 years old. Um, what was aging and what was old age like in Germany in that era and how did an elderly person live? As a man got older, how he was described and what he did for a living tended to change because his father either died or could no longer farm certain pieces of land. And so it was not easy for the, the couple as they began to get older to give up not only the land they controlled and the house they lived in, but the control over their children. So what would happen typically is as a man was moving into semi-retirement, he and his wife would draw up a written document which would specify very clearly as they turned over a piece of land to a son or perhaps a daughter a daughter who was married to someone from another family, exactly how that was going to work, exactly what they were still going to get from this family. Let's say, for example, that the young son and his wife are now going to move into the family home. It's not like many other countries where it was a multi-generational family that just expected to live together. This was quite clearly a written document that would say, 
the elder farmer and his wife reserve for their use the best room or the corner of the best room right by the fireplace and they will receive X amount of meal and potatoes. They will receive exactly the same food as the rest of the family. And there was often an additional item that said, if the living arrangements do not work out, the uh, younger son agrees that he will provide housing for them elsewhere in the village at the same level as what the elder couple is used to. So they were very careful about that transition. And, and one of the ways that an elder farmer who was moving into retirement could still control his children was that he might turn over the fields to them, but he would keep control of the farm implements so that there was still a giving relationship between the elder and the younger. The younger was still going to have to stay in the good graces of the father or was not going to be able to farm successfully. So that's kind of how they moved into retirement. They negotiated an agreement as to how their children were going to support them in their old age. And what would the process of death and uh, a funeral have been like in a German village? You know, I'm always amused when I, because I still follow some of the German genealogy websites, and, and I can tell when someone new has uh, arrived because they are planning a trip to Germany to an visit their ancestors' graves. And I always think to myself, well, good luck on that one, because one of the big differences between German burial practices and uh, American burial practices is there was a lot of land in North America. So putting in a, a cemetery was not a problem. But in Germany, land was so dear that when someone died, you rented a burial plot and you leased it so that that lease might last, say, for 20 years. And if you did not renew it at the end of 20 years, right. then the burial plot was sold to someone else and someone else was simply buried on top of the remains of that earlier person. So with very rare exceptions, and those would be in some of the bigger cities by the 19th century developing cemeteries for some of those people, you will not find old cemeteries in the villages. So that's one of the major differences in practice. And the other difference would be that uh, you were paying for certain burial services. You were paying for a sermon, for example, and uh, if you did not have the money, then you would still be buried according to the tenets of whatever religion you were following, but you would not receive all of the benefits that someone who had the money would have for their burial. What's the best piece of insight that you could offer to Americans who are just beginning to research their German ancestors? The single most valuable piece of advice I would give is that if you don't know how to get that hop across the pond and figure out where your family was from, figure out where the ancestors first immigrated to. Let's say, for example, it was Baltimore or it was Milwaukee or it was Columbus, Ohio. Immediately go to the internet and do research on what the German language churches were near that place because that first generation of German language pastors that came over were every bit as scrupulous about the records they kept as their contemporaries in Germany were. So my greatest piece of luck in finding where my ancestors were from was in tracking down where they worshipped when they first emigrated. And that first and sometimes the second generation of those churches will tell me exactly what villages they came from. So that's my primary tip. Are you currently working on any new projects? I am, as a matter of fact. Thanks for asking. I'll have to pay for this later. Um, this book has sparked so much interest and done so well, I decided to do the same kind of format uh, for um, Irish immigrants. So I am currently in the process of finishing up my research phase on, on Ireland and uh, hope to be writing and have that book published within the next year to year and a half. Oh, wonderful. Where can our listeners go to purchase your second book, Our Daily Bread? There is a website, keepajshooter.com, and they can send me an email uh, using the email me uh, feature from that website, and I will 
uh, add them to the notification list for when the Irish book is ready. Dr. T. Vashir, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thanks for having me. Your loved ones aren't going to be around forever. Have you ever wanted to sit down and ask your dad about his experience in the war, or interview your grandma to get her life story, but haven't been sure how to conduct the interview and how to ask the right questions? That's why I wrote my new book, 2,000 Questions for Grandparents, Unlocking Your Family's Hidden History. 2,000 Questions for Grandparents contains a manual on how to conduct family history interviews, as well as 2,000 questions on such topics as childhood life, memories of previous generations, world events, outlook on life, marriage and family, career and hobbies, spirituality and politics, likes and dislikes, travels and migrations, military service, and more. Purchase 2,000 Questions for Grandparents today at a special early bird discount on lulu.com. You can find a link to the book in the publications section at my website, www.schmidtgen.com. I really enjoy doing this podcast, but I also enjoy researching genealogy for other people. My professional genealogy research services are available for hire on an hourly commission basis. If you have a genealogical brick wall and you'd like to get some expert assistance, please contact me at my website, www.schmidtgen.com. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the German American Genealogist Podcast. Join me again next week as we continue bridging the German American family history gap. And don't forget to don your lederhosen and dirndls. Auf Wiedersehen! <laughs>